get started. Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Yeah, days are starting to blur together. So, uh, okay. So, a couple logistical things before we get started. Um, Ferris and I set up our office hours. My office hours are going to be 11:30 to 12:30 on Wednesdays, which is not what it says here. So, I will clearly need to change that. Um, whoa. So, okay. And. Ferris will have his office hours on Monday and Wednesday, or sorry, Monday, Friday. And I don't have the times in here yet, but I will put those in. So we will be available Monday, Wednesday, Friday if you need help, want to come talk to us. I assume that since there's no assignment yet, none of you actually want to talk to us. Um, in general, ha I'll send out the video at some point. There's a cool video that ASU created about um, not being afraid of going to your professor's office hours because it's a great way to have, get us to know you. If you look around this room, there is a lot of you. I should, probably should have said from the beginning, I will probably not remember all of your names. I'm much better at remembering faces, but names I'm really bad at. If you sit in the same area, I'll more likely to remember you over time. Um, but besides that, if you want something in the future, like a letter of recommendation or something, it's much better if you go to office hours, talk to me about whatever. That way I have a name to put to a face and so, oh, I've seen this person before, not just as a body sitting in my class answering questions during things. Uh, other cool thing, so I set up a piazza, so if you would all go and <coughs> I think you can register for this. Um, I'm actually, I'm still learning piazza, but uh, I have heard it's more trustworthy than Google Groups, so I think that'll be important for us. I'll post all course uh, announcements through here. I will also, man, this, these projectors are bad. Uh, I will also be having, we'll have all of our discussions on here. So when you have questions um, that you need answers to, you can email us directly. What we will likely do is, if that's something, if it's obviously not something that's personal and private, we will take that, create a Piazza post out of it, and then answer that question so that everyone can see the answers. Um, you all don't see this because you're about 130 people in classes, roughly. Um, but oftentimes what happens is we keep getting the same questions from different people and then answering them individually is silly. We want to share that knowledge, answer questions to everyone. Um, so I don't know, I guess general rules of civility on this apply. Be nice. Uh, answer questions from your fellow students. This is not a competition. It's not graded on a curve. You can all get A's, so help each other out. Uh, and we'll have a good time this semester. Any questions on that? Wait, how do I uh, sign up for Piazza? Wait. I, There's I, a I link on the web page. You'll be able to see it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. And is that okay to be on there? Yes, it is. All right, let's go back to where we were. All right, so we started talking about a house. Somebody log us through, revive our memories of what happened on Tuesday. What types of things were we talking about with the house in terms of threats? What threats did we come up with? Did we think those were realistic or not? What kind of policies did we talk about to defend those threats? And what kind of mechanisms did we use? Yeah. Uh, well, we brainstormed some threats. Uh, it's like un unauthorized people like coming in natural disasters, mm -hmm. um, neighbors, neighborhood. Uh, neighbors as a threat? Man, that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember being that harsh, but yes. I, being it. It meant, I think it said neighborhood, my bad. Yes. No, 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 it was, I, I'm just deeming. Um, yeah, the idea was really threats in terms of your, you shouldn't be worried about, in terms of a house, people across the world. You should be worried about the people kind of around you physically because those are the people who can have physical access to what you're trying to protect. Anything else? What else? Yeah. Uh, so like a threat could be a fire. Mm -hmm. The mechanism to put it out is a fire extinguisher. Yes. The policy is to replace it every year. Whenever you're supposed to replace fire extinguishers. Yeah. yeah, read the instruction manual, figure out when to replace it. So that's a great example. So the threat, I think we can all agree that fire is definitely a threat. Do you guys have to take fire training? May I ask you just staff again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You have to be in a lab then. Huh? If you're in a lab then you have to take fire. Ah, okay, yeah. So if you're employed, I guess maybe employed or in a lab or something. So we take fire, so 
as part of, if you think about ASU, ASU, they're worried about the threat of fire. What are they also worried about in that context? <laughs> of a threat, what's that? No, in terms of fire, let's say. Do people dying, yeah, for sure. What was that? Who said it? Yes, getting sued, exactly. So these are all things they're worried about. So if a fire ha happens, and then somebody says, well, what is your policy in training your staff to deal with the fire? And they say, oh, we don't have any policy. Uh, then they could get they're maybe <coughs> legally liable for whatever happens. So that's why, as part of being employed by ASU, I have to take fire and safety training every year. So I did it when I started. Like, literally, you do that in orientation. And then you do it once every year of re-upping so that you can so that way they know their employees can respond to a fire appropriately if it happens, and then that way they can't be sued if something bad happens, because they can say, look, we train all of our employees every year on this, so we have proper policies and mechanisms in place. So the policy would be everyone needs to take fire, every ASU employee needs to take fire training every year. Uh, a mechanism to enforce that is a little thing in my ASU, which you, guys, which you have probably not seen, which bugs you if you're out of date on your thing. And then you start getting emails from your boss saying you really need to do your fire training. Um, so those are all the mechanisms that they put in place. Awesome. Did anybody have any uh, inspiration, threat-based inspiration over the last two days and want to share with us a cool threat that they've come up with? Yeah, nobody woke up in the middle of the night. Um, oh, God, it's crazy. Did right anyone think of breaking, uh, I've been thinking about that class for a day now. <laughs> did anyone think of breaking into windows or something? Yeah, we actually didn't talk about that. Breaking into, well, we talked about unauthorized access, right? We actually focused a lot on the door, and I think somebody also mentioned windows and in the sense of putting bars on the windows. But one of the things, and especially this is, I don't know, has anyone ever got locked out of their house before, house or apartment? What, what do you start doing? Yeah, you start, check, you start thinking like an attacker, and you start thinking, how can I break into this apartment or house? Right? And so you start to evaluate everything in a different light. You start to think, huh, how easy is it to take these screens off of these windows? Which windows are unlocked that I can just move them over? Um, if your first floor windows are done, then you start thinking about the bathroom window on the second floor that may be by a tree or a fence that you can climb up. Nobody ever done this? Okay. <laughs> so you're like, just me. So, walk out of their house before. Um, so yeah, and this, and this goes into when we talked about the house itself, right? So what's important is understanding that physical context, context in this case. Are there trees that are right by our windows so that somebody can climb up easily to the second story and get in those windows? So do our mechanisms and policies have to deal with locking every single window in the house or just kind of that first floor window? Um, we'd look at the house and we'd say, where are the drainage pipes where somebody could maybe climb up those pipes? Um, yeah? Uh, it made me think of an interesting like, possible threat. Like maybe people, like creepy people come in and like spying on yeah. you, you know? So we didn't talk about privacy at all. So what's the, do you have, cur does, do most people have curtains on their windows or some kind of blinds or something? Yeah, is that strictly necessary in terms of securing unauthorized people from entering your house? It's a good deterrent. Why is it a good deterrent? Because they don't know. Because they don't know what's in there, right? So if they don't know what's in there, maybe why bother breaking into your place when they can see that there's actual things to steal in somebody else's place? But we do that in mostly in terms of privacy, right? Because we want to make sure that... So that's another kind of threat that we didn't really talk about is... We don't want people to be able to see into our house because that's kind of our, our private space. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really talk about walls that much. Mm -hmm. Unless you li have like a, like a brick house or something, a lot of them are made of like drywall and wood, mm -hmm. so they could just go through the walls. Yeah, so that would be depending on our threat model, right? If we are storing something incredibly valuable, if I told you I have a million dollars in my house, which I do not, <laughs> but if I did, I may be worried about people ramming a car or something just into the side of my house to get in. Like, why bother with doors or windows at that point? Uh, a car is worth way less than a million dollars, usually depending on what car you use, right? And so it might be worth it to just total the car to get access to the house, to steal the money, and then leave. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you said, like, getting locked out. Mm -hmm. The first thing I thought about would be, like, calling my roommate, but what if somebody else calls you? 
Yeah, or think about a locksmith. Anybody ever call a locksmith because they're locked down? What do they do? Break into your house. Yeah, they break into your house, right? They literally <laughs> come to your house with all the tools necessary and the knowledge of how to break into <laughs> almost, I would say, most locks on houses. Um, and they're, I believe they're supposed to check your ID to see if you live there. I don't know how much that actually happens, and I actually don't know the legal requirements in every state, but, uh, but yeah, so similar to that thing, right? What if somebody just calls a locksmith and says, hey, I'm locked out of my house, I really need to get in there, like, I don't know, you could say something like, my dog's in there and they haven't been fed and they have no water, like, and so the locksmith comes and you're creating this sense of urgency that they maybe don't check your ID or, I don't know, you, you kind of trick them somehow and then they let you into the house. Yeah, so these are all things definitely that we should be thinking about, so. Cool, so what are our goals of <coughs> security policy? So we've been talking, we talked through uh, an example, we talked through an example of a lot of different threats. Uh, we talked about policies and mechanisms. So what is our goal with our security policies? Yeah? They just want to be that they're simple to follow. Say it louder. They're simple to follow. Simple to follow, why should they be simple to follow? Right, exactly, because a policy by itself does nothing, right? Essentially, it's a set of written rules, but rules have to be enforced, and people have to actually follow the rules for them to be, um, and so that actually goes to what we were talking about earlier about thinking about the human factor, right? Thinking about who's implementing these rules, right? The locksmith example is a pretty good example because, so if the policy says that all locksmiths should check everybody's driver's license before they open up a house, well, would you expect all locksmiths to be able to properly validate people's identification? It would probably be maybe easier to fool a locksmith with a fake ID than a bouncer at a nightclub who deals with that literally all the time, right? So thinking about who's actually doing this, how easy is it for them to follow that policy if the policy is crazy complicated, and how would you, why would you expect people to actually follow it? Yeah, that's good. What other goals? Yeah. Uh, you want to make sure that you're being efficient. So like you wouldn't have three locks with the same key on the same door. Nice, interesting. So you wouldn't, you may not want, although, so let's say you may not want three locks on the same door, but a lot of doors actually do have multiple locks. Why is that? But they aren't the same lock though. They're not the same lock, but in what sense? So, yeah. One's like a deadbolt, the other one's just like a... So what's the difference? It's harder to break, like to just like ram through a, break, uh, a deadbolt. Yeah, so there may be multiple kinds of locks, right? There could be, um, I'd say most, when you think of door locks, probably have at least two. One that's like the normal lock and one that's a deadbolt that you slide in. And again, I'm not a construction person, but the deadbolt goes into the wood, so it should be a lot harder to break down that door if it's deadbolted in. It's not impossible, it can still be done. Uh, but it increases the bar. What else? Anybody see any other kind of locks? And why? Yeah? Maybe different like, combination locks where you don't need like, an external mechanism. Okay, so a combination lock, yeah, maybe on your bike, which maybe has a four digit lock, a four digit combo, so you don't have to carry around the key all the time, so you don't have to lose your key and get locked out. Yeah? Uh, the locks, they can only be locked from the inside. And yeah, so maybe stay in a hotel. You stay in a hotel, there's these at least three kinds of locks usually. There's the normal lock, there's the deadbolt, and then there's the like chain that it can only be open from the inside, right? So there, um, so why does that kind of lock exist? Housekeeping. Housekeeping or the hotel, right? In some sense, because you're staying in that room, your security policy is you probably don't want anyone to come in from the hotel's perspective, I mean, they can literally just make a key card for your room to open that key card door, right, oftentimes. So that's why they provide an additional mechanism for you of this chain lock that can suppose it's, it's still, of course, not completely secure because somebody could very easily still open it, but it gives you an additional level of protection and assurance, yeah. Uh, on, this, on a similar vein, there are locks that have master keys. Mm. Like here, ASU. 
right? Like I have keys. Maybe I shouldn't show you because technically you could take a picture of this and make these keys, but uh, I actually don't remember which is which, so that's good. One of these is a key to my office, and the other one's a key to our lab's uh, server room. And so I have these keys. They work supposedly only in those doors, but when you think about how does, um, if maintenance needs to go into those rooms, do they have to find me to open that key? No, they have either their own copy of the key or all the keys, are, all the locks are made such that there's a master key that kind of, or another term is skeleton key that opens kind of all those doors in an organization. Yeah, so it depends on the security goals, yeah. Uh, tamper evident locks? Hmm. What's that? Like if someone tries to break the lock, they might be able to, but it becomes rather evident that that was what happened. Yeah, so one of the problems, I mean, one problem with a lot of locks is, well, how do you know if somebody broke in? I mean, it depends <laughs> on the lock, but, <coughs> you know, uh, you may not even know that somebody was in because they either made a fake key or they lock-picked your door and just opened it and got in. Um, so a tamper-evident lock would say, okay, I'm fine with somebody getting in, but I want to know that they actually got in. So this kind of goes to the logging and those kind of things. So we got off on a bit of a tangent, so let's go back to kind of the goals of security policies. Mainly yeah. for the houses, to prevent vacants. To prevent vacants, but go a little bit more abstract. So thinking about security policies in general. So what? So from thinking of that, so what was the point of creating a specific policy? prevent specifically what happened? Threat. A threat, yeah, exactly. To prevent a specific threat. So usually, I mean, this is why these are so interrelated, right? You think about the threats to your system, you think about what threats you want to defend against, and then you create policies that address those specific threats. Any other goals? Yeah. Leaves room for kind of growth and change in those policies. So you don't have something that relies on this policy and that relies on this policy. <coughs> that re require you to rewrite the entire security policy. Right, so you definitely, and this is something talking to people in industry that I've found over and over again, is they tell me that, so actually one thing I wanted to do was to get a company's old security policies so that we could all read it and understand it and critique it, and they said, yeah, that'd be super cool, but the problem is like our current policy is basically an evolution of our old policy. Even though it's changed a lot, it's still kind of evolved from that original thing, so we're not really comfortable sharing that with you. Um, and so when we think about it, really, so there's kind of three types of things that we think about in terms of security policy goals, which is all the things that we've talked about, right? We want to prevent things from happening in the sense that we want to prevent threats, right? This is what we talked about. So uh, we're worried about fire. The policy is we need to have a working fire extinguisher in every room and to in order to prevent fi a fire. So if a fire happens, we can try to put it out before it occurs. All right. Another thing that we talked about, and this is with like the tamper evident locks, is detection. So we want to know if something happens, right? So this would be, in the house example, we talked about installing a security system through some company that has motion sensors and will alert somebody when somebody unauthorizes in the house. Right? That doesn't by itself prevent anybody from breaking into our house. Right? It may, let's say it could deter people from breaking into the house. Right? If you have the sign that says we, this house is secured by this security company, which actually leads to an effect of people just putting up those signs but not actually having the security system in place. Um, but, but still these are useful, so why are they useful? Well, for computers, mm -hmm. it's very, if someone were to access it, you need to be able to know that someone accessed your data. Right, exactly, and this extends to pretty much every type of scenario, right? So you think of, if you're a company, you wanna try to prevent people from attacking you, breaking into your system, stealing your data. I think we'd agree with that? Yes, more or less. But at the same time, you need to be realistic and understand that nothing is 100% secure. There's always gonna be something that possibly happens, right?
right? I mean, there's you can spend as much money as you want on security. There's been a lot of examples of this. I would say, um, I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase is a huge banking system. Banks take security incredibly seriously. And yet, in I think it was 2014, they had like a hundred and well, I don't remember the exact number of credit cards, but they had a hacker in their network for six months who stole a bunch of user information and credit card accounts and all this stuff. And they didn't even know that that, that person or group was in there for six months. There was the right? Equifax hack. Too. Yes, and the Equifax hack was also another very good one, right? So it's, and so I, I don't know about that one. I th actually, I think Equifax might have been a lot of the ways that these are detected is because people start looking at underground forums, start seeing what credit cards are being sold on there. They report that to like Amex, Visa, and MasterCard, and then they run analysis to see what do all these numbers have in common. Oh, they were all used by this one realtor, which means their credit cards must have been hacked, and that's kind of how they found out. Target was another one that was like this, where Target was hacked actually through their, H, uh, their HVAC system the like AC system, and then they got a bunch of their credit cards. <laughs> so yeah, you think about, as a security company, that's very embarrassing, or as an organization, because your data's out there, you don't even know about it, you haven't detected anything. So you'd much rather detect something as it happens, so you can respond to it and address it there. I think there was a hand back there. Something to add? No? I said everything you wanted to say? Okay, cool, awesome. <coughs> so but there's a third goal here that we really wanna do, with security policies, and that's recovery. So why is recovery important? Yeah. Recovery is important because whatever information might be stolen, <coughs> might have been altered or misused. Mm -hmm. So by recovering it, we know, now know um, what information was taken and how it was used against us. Right, so exactly. So we want to we want to be able to, so there's a couple different things in here, right? One thing is we need to be able to get our systems back into their original state, right? So if we find out that some developer's laptop is compromised, we want to be able to revert our systems back to a state where they're not compromised, and then ideally figure out how, how it happened, how they got in, so that you can prevent it in the future. So you can actually think of these in kind of a circular fashion where you have these, these security goals, you want to prevent as much as you can. Why do you want to prevent as much as you can? Because no one's really going to accept, well, we found it really quick, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, if you have perfect detection, but people are still attacking you all the time and stealing all your user data or compromising the security, you're that's, still, yeah, you're still, still, your data is still out there, right? You're still under attack, even though your detection is perfect. So you want to prevent as many things as you can. One thing that I will say that uh, <laughs> um, companies can get into trouble with is trying to say, oh, look at how many attacks per day we prevent. So what they'll do is they'll cast a very wide net. So we haven't really talked about it yet, but one of the major ways when I talked about um, going around and jiggling uh, front doors to see if doors are unlocked, one of the main ways to do that is port scanning on the internet. So port scanning is basically send I mean, many different ways. In TCP, it's basically sending a SYN packet to every single port on an IP address to see which port you get a SYN ACK back, which means that there's some application listening on that port. So you can say, oh, there's port 80 listening, there's, um, which is a web server, there's port 443, and there's an SSH server, and maybe there's a Samba server that's running an old version that you can break into. But what a lot of companies do is that they can consider that an attack and then say, we detect port <coughs> scans and then we block them. So we've prevented that attack. But really, a port scan itself is not really an attack because nothing has happened yet. It's really part of the reconnaissance phase. So it's just a, um, people can get hung up on raw numbers of prevention without actually thinking through what are the things that they're super, should be really worried about that they're not preventing. Right? Like insider attacks, which we talked about. Like if you're not preventing those type of things, then you have a huge attack surface that you have left open. So these really feed into each other, right? So you want to prevent as many things as you can, and you need to be realistic and say, okay, we cannot 
prevent everything. So we need to make sure we have mechanisms and pol I mean, policies and mechanisms in place so that we can detect when something happened. And then we can respond to that and try to recover. So in order, and the idea would be you learn from that incident and you put new policies, new mechanisms in place in order to prevent what happened. Yeah. So they, <coughs> is this kind of like uh, organized like chronologically, like before the attack, you want to prevent it. When it happens, you want to catch it and after. Yes, exactly. So, so think about that in terms of a single attack, exactly. So you can think about like, I don't know. Or you can think about it in terms of like a big stream of events coming in and kind of a funnel. So you'll have a bunch of people, I mean, a bunch of people organizations attacking you. You will prevent hopefully a large chunk of that. Some of them will get through and things will happen. So you need to be able to detect as many of that as possible so that you can go back, put uh, policies and mechanisms in place so that you prevent those in the future. And so what's the, I mean, what's, we talked about it a little bit, but in that kind of idea, what's the problem with having poor detection? You never go to the recovery, you never go to the recovery stage, so you never learn to prevent those attacks. Right, so if you're not detecting things, you're not gonna put procedures and mechanisms in place in order to prevent those in the future. Right, so this is why these are all super important. And the other thing is, so it's very easy when we think about threats and security policies and security mechanisms to focus on prevention and detection, right? Because we're just thinking about, okay, when somebody breaks in, what happens? But it's just as important to think about that third component of how do we recover? If you don't have backups, how could you ever recover from an attacker who deletes all your data? You will not, right? And you will just be hoping and wishing that, that something works. So, so these are why these three areas are really all incredibly important and they need to be thought about kind of holistically, right? So that that way, and you build this in with your policies. One of your recovery policies would be, okay, after an incident happens, the analyst that managed that incident will write up an incident report about what happened and make suggestions about how to change the policies, how, what new mechanisms to put into place in order to prevent and maybe detect this in the future. And then you would add that into your cycle. So you build that in to your policies kind of from the start. Any questions? Policy experts. So how do we define policies? We've kind of been talking about them very abstract, well, not, ab yeah, fairly abstractly. How do we define them? Yeah. Can you? Just like, like writing it out. Yeah, writing a written natural language policy written in English. This is good, bad, pros, cons. English can be ambiguous. Surely you're joking. Um, yeah, so English can be very <coughs> ambiguous. It may not specify exactly what you want to do. It may not be clear. What are some other issues? Yeah. Just because someone can read it and go like, all right, I'm supposed to change my password every 180 days, they may not know, well, why do I have to do that? Mm, intent, so yeah. the. Uh, so in English, I guess this is kind of a common problem with security policies, and especially as, let's say, like a CISO, like a chief information security officer at the top of the company specifies policies, and then they go down four or five layers where they're actually implemented by real people. Um, that knowledge and intuition about why should I be doing this maybe doesn't translate all the way down. That could definitely be a problem. Yeah, that's a good point. Spoken almost as if somebody was a low-level employee at some point and following policies they don't understand. Yeah. Uh, if something's written in very simple language, it might not cover a more technical problem. Right. So then you have the problem of English in the sense that okay, it's it's ambiguous, but maybe it's too simple in the sense that it doesn't specify what should happen in every scenario. Right. Maybe it's leaving out some corner cases that come up, and because the intent isn't really conveyed either the person who's following this policy doesn't know what to do. Like a weird, I guess, what would that be? A weird example, yeah, 
I don't know, I mean, this happens all the time. I was trying to come up with an example based on the change your password every 180 days. So like, what happens if, I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, okay, so the change their password like 180 days, if that's the policy, but you keep using the same password, right? That would be bad, or what if you just keep adding like one to the end of your password every time you change it? Um, also bad, but still following the policies. Yeah. Anything else? We've been talking about how English and natural language is bad, but is there any pros? Yeah. It's understandable. Understandable? Yeah. So it can be, right? So it can definitely go the other way and be if you write your policies in too much of a like legalese where it's very formally written, it may not be understandable, but in general you can write a security policy that is understandable by people, which is good because people are the ones implementing your policy. Any other benefits? <coughs> yeah. Uh, easy, more easily changeable as mm. well. Yeah, so ease of change, right? So. You want to change the policy, you open up the policy in a Word doc, you add some new sentence, new clause, new paragraph, and then you communicate that out to everyone that the policy has now changed. You hopefully explain your reasonings why, about how this is gonna make everybody more secure, but changing that really doesn't uh, change things too much. Another way is you can use math. So you could formally specify your policy in a incredibly formal language so that and what would be one of the benefits here? Clear. What was that? Um, you can have proofs. And proofs? Yeah, you could maybe prove something about your policy. You can say that the system will never get into state XYZ if we follow this policy. Somebody over here? Precise. precise. Yes, math is very precise. Has anyone <coughs> got an answer wrong on a math assignment? Because you did something wrong? Math is just like a compiler, right? It doesn't care what you intended to mean. If you forget a semicolon, your, com your program doesn't compile, and it's the same as you writing a uh, garbage program anyways. It's not gonna try to do its best effort. Similarly in math, math is gonna formally specify exactly what the policy should be. Anything else? I think there were some hands in the back. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say that there's no room for ambiguity. Yeah. Kind of no, no, that's good. So yeah, no room for, well, hopefully no room for ambiguity, right, because everything is formally specified. Uh, I was going to say, like, a con. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as understandable as, like, a natural language. If you Why not? Someone, uh, stack of, like, statistics, they're like, oh, all these numbers, like, what, is, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, so would, does everyone agree that it would be not as easily understandable? As a not mathematically inclined person, I would definitely agree with that statement. You have to figure out all the definitions, figure out how they're defining things, figure out what notation they're using, which could be a real bear, yeah. Uh, lack of ambiguity could also be a con as well, because if you have a global policy defined in this way, but your sub-organizations have different requirements and needs, now they also have to go in and redefine the global policy within that framework. Right, so the, the lack of ambiguity can actually be a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, it should be clear in every situation what the policy means and how you should operate. On the other hand, I mean, I'd say defining all of those corner cases can be a real bear, and in, with natural language, you can trust that the human on the other end can kind of do their best, or you can say, or in this situation, they should do whatever you know their best interests are. And then this gets more complicated if you think exactly of like, a global, let's say a global uh, conglomerate, like a big company that has a lot of subdivisions in different uh, countries, which is what a lot of things do. So they'll have like the US branch and the Europe branch and all these different branches of the company that are each in charge of running their own thing. And now you have to make sure that all of that is using the same like ontology and they're all using the same languages when they're defining these formal definitions of a policy. Any other cons? Yeah. For mathematics, you don't you don't have to translate it like if some, like you said, different like places they speak different languages, but in math you don't have to translate. Well, oh, that's interesting. So that's like interesting. That's that would be a pro then in some sense, where you don't have to translate it to a different language. Um, I'd say 
language in some sense, so as long as they can understand the math and then follow along, then it doesn't really matter in their local language. That's cool. Um, you can also go kind of an in-between type <coughs> thing. You can use a specific policy language, so you can write the policy in, um, sorry, this mic is too, I don't know what to do about it. Um, so you can write your policy in a kind of in between, so like a machine readable language. Um, one of the examples of this is uh, XACML, which is access control rules defined in an XML schema. Um, so what would be some of the benefits there? Standards. What was that? Standards. So. Standards, so maybe there's other like applications, so people can, if it's a standard language, people can write things that interpret it, understand it, display it to you, yeah. Adding to it can be easier. There can be tools that help you. There can be tools that check the correctness of the schema or of, of the changes that you made. Yeah. What else? I said the con would be like learning it. Yeah. Learning another language, right? So it's not necessarily math. It's not English. It's this weird thing that has its own thing like learning C or C++ or JSON or I don't know any of these other kind of like data format languages. You need to understand the semantics of the language and what things mean. Yeah. You still have to translate it down to your user base. Yeah. So somebody, if somebody's going to implement these policies, right? If it's humans, at some point it needs to be translated down. Maybe if it's easily machine readable, it maybe it's easy to translate down, right? So you could have a mapping to English language, but then that may not, Why not be as nice to read. Language. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's also the point is to have like um, a fine-tuned balance between formalism, mathematics, and the ambiguity of natural language. So policy language allows you to kind of like to hit the sweet spot. In there. Yeah, that that's the idea. I'm a little bit skeptical on how much it actually does. I think in certain domains it definitely does help, and it's kind of the de facto standard in those domains. If you think about a general security policy. Yeah, it's, it is very tricky because you do want those, you would like to be able to say things like, with this security policy, no unauthorized user can access the house, right? And then a, with a policy language or with math, you may be able to prove that. With natural language, you may have to reason about it, right, without this kind of benefit of a formal reasoning system. Yeah. It has the same problem as mathematics where you have to define all your fringe cases. Yes, definitely. So you'd need to define or if, let's say, all the cases aren't defined, you need to understand the semantics of the policy language. So if you have a way to allow certain users to so say, okay, these people can maybe access the house, there's probably a default value for when it doesn't match any of those users, which would deny them, right? And so you need to understand that semantics, otherwise your policy may not even accurately capture what you mean, which is the same problem we have in programming. Anybody ever write code that doesn't do what they wanted it to do? Yes. Yes. Right? It happens all the time. It happens to me all the time. And you're sitting there staring at the code being like, why doesn't it work in the way it's supposed to work in my head? Right? Same thing with the policy. And with the math or a policy language, if you're not checking it, it may not, you may not ever detect that, that it's doing something that you didn't know because it's doing exactly what the policy language says it should be doing. Cool. Good discussion. So how could you how could you test how you understand the correctness of a security policy? Yeah. Um, you could test it, like run like fake drill. Perhaps someone come in and be like, hey, how do I do? How do I, what do I do if I like I'm alone with my kid in the bathroom or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a, a really good example. I mean. Uh, in, so yeah, that's a good idea. So thinking about thinking about this in terms of like taking the ideas from software testing, right? Saying, well, how do you test the correctness of a program? Well, one way is coming up with test cases, essentially running through the policy with your test cases to see if the outcome based on the policy is what it actually is supposed to be, right? Yeah. If you can justify it. 
If you can say that again? If you can justify it. Justify it? What does that mean? So if I can go to someone in my, in my organization and say, all right, this is why we're having you change your password mm -hmm. every 180 days, that might make sense. But if I say, all right, this is why we're having you turn around three times and put on a blindfold before you enter the building, that might not work. Right, so okay, you could, uh, I'd say maybe put that under almost like user acceptance testing in some way, right? Like yeah. go to the actual employees, maybe run through again drills about how this policy would work to see if they actually do what the policy says they should do, right? In that case, after a certain point, they're not gonna bother with blindfolds like, going into the building because that's silly, right? Yeah? Uh, I would say it's kind of important to check it against your metrics, so you know, prevention, detection, Yeah, and then, so go, and then go back up to what is this policy supposed to be doing, right? Why do we have this policy in the first place, right? Does this policy actually address what we want it to address? And then does it address these three areas that we talked about exactly? Prevention, detection, recovery. And what was it supposed to address, right? That's another important thing. So yeah, I like thinking about that in terms of metrics. That's good, yeah. yeah. Good, uh, compare it to other industry policies. Ooh, good, yeah. Um, so yeah, that would be, uh, and you may borrow one of those to start, right? And then use that going forward as the start of your policy. Um, so yeah, if, and that's going with the password changing idea. If you say, well, I don't know, if you were coming up with that on your own and you said, we're gonna change passwords every week, and then you go and start looking at other policies and you realize at some point, well, people do at least, I don't know, like three months is the normal time frame of changing passwords. And then you'd probably find out that NIST has not recommended changing passwords anymore. It's much more important to have to enforce difficult to guess passwords so that even the password changing advice is being changed now. Um, but, but yeah, but checking with kind of the industry, but at the same time, should you trust, if you do this and everyone says, yeah, don't worry about that? Not necessarily. Why not? Because everyone could be wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, all and they're all, every kind of organization has different business requirements and different kind of scenarios that they're worried about, right? You may be terrified about some threat that nobody else is, is terrified about, right? And so if your policy is to address that unique threat to you, then even if other people's policies don't do that, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily wrong. Uh, we can get someone to audit our policy. Yeah, hire someone, right? You can hire someone and they'll, they would probably go through similar things of essentially you can think of it as red teaming or almost penetration testing the policy itself. So thinking through about scenarios. Okay, what happens if this happens? What, what does the policy say should happen? So it's actually even assuming that, so it's, it's kind of a cool way of assume the policy is implemented 100% correctly and everybody does exactly what they're supposed to do. Is there still a way for us to break it and to break your your um, security requirements? Yeah. yeah. Uh, post disaster review of the policy as well. Mm. So yeah, so as part of so rather than assuming at the start that your policy is going to be correct and perfect, right? You would build in as I guess I guess this would be a security policy policy as after you have an event, you'd go back and reevaluate your security policy in the context of that event and see what you needed to update and change based on that. So that you know over time your policy is evolving to combat the threats that you're actually seeing. And it doesn't even have to be your company either. Yeah, it could be, and this is actually what I've um, seen more and more talking to companies, is what's really interesting is companies will be like basically you think about like background radiation, there's always some background radiation on the internet of everybody's kind of always under attack by people who are just running automated tools against everyone. Um, as you get kind of more important, like the big, you know, Google, Microsoft, I mean, Facebook, these people are always under constant attack by really dedicated attackers. But each actual niche like of industry will have their own attackers that just target them and nobody else. Uh, I, it's hard for me to come up with an example without giving the companies away that I'm talking about because I don't think they want me to do that necessarily. But they will tell you if you talk to them that they face 
like not just general attackers, but attackers that target their specific industry and know their industry really well. So it actually behooves them to talk with their competitors about what attacks, what threats are you seeing so that they can proactively update their own policies and mechanisms to combat those threats. Just super interesting. Cool. Any other ideas? Correctness? Policies. Think. Thinking helps. Um, so one thing to think about is assumptions. So this is actually something we didn't talk about. Uh, we, so we have to make some kind of assumptions. Right? So what are some assumptions that we've talked about now, let's say not with the house, but in the examples we've just talked about? Yeah? That everyone's going to follow it correctly. Yeah, then we assume that everyone will follow the policy correctly. Right? So when we're thinking about the correctness of a security policy, we need to revisit those assumptions to say, are they realistic? Do they make sense? Right? If we're assuming that, I, I still don't really understand the blindfold example, but let's say we don't want people to know where the business is, so we blindfold all the employees when we bring them to work or something. Um, you know, that maybe will not be followed, or we forget that everyone has GPS on their phone, so they'll all know where they are, right? Um, yeah? Uh, that they have the resources to dedicate towards a formal security policy? Ah, so yeah, even assuming that we can actually create a security policy. Yeah, or that, I mean, one of the other assumptions is that we can afford all of the mechanisms that our security policy relies on. If that's not the case, so if we assume we have an intrusion detection system, we have this optimum firewall thing, we have monitoring running on all the hosts in our network, and it turns out we only get one of those things, but the policy remains the same, now that policy is not effective because it doesn't have the mechanisms in order to do whatever it needs to do. What, what assumptions do we make in our house example? Location. Location, we talked about the location. Normal person. We talked about, what was that? Normal person. Yeah, that it's like a normal person living there. So if somebody rich and famous bought that house, now that current security policy is completely useless, right? Because our assumptions have fundamentally changed. We assume the definition of a house, yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe instead of a house we built like a missile bunker or something, wait, that's not the right term. Uh, underground bunker? Yeah, that's the word I was looking for, like an underground bunker or something, right? That's like, would have completely different security requirements than a house. Um, and, you know, this is one of the important things of checking up, or you think about uh, a startup, so you think about a startup company, right? They initially start building product A, and at a certain point pivot into product B. Like, let's say Twitter. Twitter, what were they first doing? I think it was a blogging platform or something, and then somebody started creating this like uh, small message sharing thing internally, and then they changed the entire company to start doing that, if I recall. Does anybody, am I making things up? Does anybody remember this? Okay, so you don't know, so it might as well be the truth. <laughs> I feel like I heard about that. Yeah, I think, I think, I believe that's an, an example. So they completely shifted the company, but if they were still had all their security policies in place about this old product, then it clearly makes zero sense, right? Because their assumptions have changed. Cool. So we, it's like we said, and we should revisit our assumptions to make sure they make sense or update the policy to reflect the fact that well, maybe we don't think that everyone will follow this policy. So can we put mechanisms in place to ensure that they are following the policy, right? And, you know, some of these things we kind of assume the policy, well, I guess this is a little circular argument, but uh, we, one of the assumptions would be that if we buy a lock and a key to that lock, that this is the only key that can open that lock. Uh, it used to be, I don't think it works anymore, you know like the U-shaped bike locks? Yeah. Um, so it's like has a bar like this, a U like this, and you lock it or unlock it. It used to be, so they had these, um, I think at the time, they said they had these completely unhackable keys because the key, instead of being like a flat 2D thing, was a circle <coughs> that you'd put into the end of the lock to open it up. It turns out you could take a big pen and 
the end of a big pen and just jam it into the lock and the lock would pop off. <laughs> right? So some of the assumptions that you're making are that your mechanisms actually implement the policy, right? Or that the mechanisms actually work correctly and that there's no vulnerabilities in the mechanisms. If there are, then you have to start, you know, or if you think there might be, you need to start planning for that and start considering that as part of your security policy. So this is why these things can be very complicated. Um, also, trust. Well, how does trust factor into this? Yeah. So you trust, there's a lot of trust, right? You're trusting the mechanisms, you're trusting the policy itself, you're trusting the people who created the policy, right? If you're CISO, you don't trust your CISO to create the security policy, they could just uh, not put in a very important security policy component and then later use that themselves in order to steal money or do whatever they want. Um, so yeah, so we need to, you know, part of, but, Part of analyzing and thinking about the correctness of a security policy is making this explicit and stating, okay, if the policy, the policy would be correct under these assumptions, and uh, if we trust you know, these people or these, these entities or these mechanisms, right? And so that's really important when you're thinking about the correctness of a security policy. Who do you trust? Um, should you actually trust those people? Are there now, is part of the policy or mechanisms to audit those people that you should be trusting, right? To make sure that they were trustworthy. We talked, we talked about we talked about email delegation, right, on Tuesday, mm -hmm. like having somebody else. So, as part of maybe letting somebody email on your behalf, maybe a policy you put in place to reduce the trust necessary in that person is just review all the emails they send once a week, or have somebody else do that, right? So you have kind of a somebody checking that other person just to make sure nothing terrible happens. Cool. All right, so mechanisms. So what kind of mechanisms? So, we, so we've been talking about policies a lot. So policies, again, at a high level are how things should work, right? I mean, or how, what things people should be doing in order to ensure the security of a system. So what about mechanisms? So what kind of mechanisms, if we're thinking generally about mechanisms? How should we be thinking about that? Yeah. Um, we should think of them as an extension of the policy, but also um, we should check the doors, locks, um, the systems themselves. Yeah, so we, we would think of, so mechanisms, we'd think about basically, I mean, their goal is to support the policy, right? Because without the mechanisms, a policy is just a piece of paper, right? So the mechanisms, and they can be kind of technical mechanisms. So what are some mechanisms that we've talked about in our examples of policies and mechanisms? <coughs> yeah. Firewalls. Firewalls. So what's a firewall? Filter. Yeah. So a firewall at a very basic level just filters, well, you could say puts rules into place about who can access what parts of your network, usually externally, is how that's done. Although a lot of your current computers have basically built-in firewalls so that um, I can't just make a request directly to one of the ports on your computer. What else? Locks. What was that? Uh, I said locks. Locks. Yeah, locks, right? A lock is a mechanism. What else? Yeah. Um, fingerprint scanners? Oh, finger Fingerprint scanners, yeah. So my laptop has a fingerprint scanner, so don't cut off my finger if you want to get in my computer. I would probably glad you'd just give you the password if we're in that situation. Uh, yeah, so fingerprint scanners, yeah. Uh, face ID. Yeah, so a facial ID, so like the face ID on your phone, or I know some laptops have kind of the facial recognition. But again, it goes back to trust. How much do you trust those systems? As much as we trust who manufactured it. What was that? As much as we trust whoever manufactured them. Ooh, how, as much as you trust whoever manufactured them. That's definitely part of it. Would you bet 
let's say, would you put a million dollars of your own money behind a facial recognition scanner? No. no. Why not? Because I don't trust it. Because you don't trust it. Why don't you trust it? <coughs> yeah, it can be manipulated. The very early ones, all it took was a picture of a person. <laughs> Hold up. And then they said, well, we'll do a liveness check. So rather than just recognize the face itself, we'll try to see, is that an actual person there? So one of the things they'd look at is, are the eyes moving? So then what do the attackers do? Move the eyes. Yeah, so you create a picture of the person with the little eye cutouts, and then you put like a thing back there, and you move the eyes, and then it would let them in. And then I think, I don't know if the face ID stuff does it, but allegedly it has a, I think it has like, is doing like a 3D reconstruction, kind of like, uh, what are those things? Like the Connect can do of using sonar to gr create 3D images. So then if you want to break that, you just sculpt somebody's face until it breaks it, right? Until it can break it. Um, so yeah, so, and this is actually part of you know, if you're relying, so this is exactly what we just talked about, right? If you're relying on that mechanism of a facial ID, rec like a face scanner, you better understand all the ways that can break, and you better be able to understand your trust in that system. So why do you actually trust that system if it has a if it has a important role to play? Um, what are some other mechanisms? Yeah. Like oh that. no, I was just gonna talk on the last sure. thing. Um, it's sometimes it can be like a toss up, right? Because like say you protect a million dollars with a password, where anyone could be like, okay, I'm, I can guess a password. Right? Mm -hmm. But with a face ID, it kind of has to be more targeted, like specifically for you. Right, so then you need to think about your threats, right? So if I just have, let's say, uh, my laptop, which doesn't really have anything interesting on it. I mean, I don't know, it has research code on there. It doesn't have your grades on there. You need a password for that. Let's do something else maybe. Um, yeah, or like a phone, right? Your phone is super important, but I'm not super worried about a nation state level person crafting a face of my face to get into my phone. I mean, for me, that threat is a little bit outside of the realm of what I'm going to worry about, which, and it's super useful to just be able to look at your phone and have it unlock. Um, so thinking about the usability versus the security features, and it's way better than not having any passcode at all on your phone, right? So that's the other key feature. So what I would, yeah, so what I would say is, so that is a little bit of a tricky scenario because usually it's Brian Krebs, who's a famous security logger, um, used to be a journalist and now went kind of on his own independent. He's actually one who finds a lot of these things because he has a lot of connections, so it's not actually the company themselves. But I do know that some of them do, as part of their security policy, we will have people who go on underground forums to see what things are being sold and try to correlate that with our customers to see if it's our customers' data and information that are out there. So they may have that as part of their policy and their mechanism would be basically hiring a person to doing that. Yeah, yeah. In configuring your environment, uh, set up things that kind of block parts of the security policy, like if I don't want someone to be plugging in a USB drive into any of my systems, I can go into the BIOS and disable that, those ports. Do you have a password on your BIOS? Not uh, on this machine, yes. I'm saying in general, right? So then that would yeah. be the other question. Uh, one thing that people, I think, used to do, if you don't want people to plug in USB drives, put epoxy or something on the USB ports so you cannot plug in any USB devices. That looks disgusting, though. Yes, I've it does. That. <laughs> it does. It's gross. Um, uh, but that is, um, yeah, so those are types of things that you can do to try to mechanisms to put into place. Um, there's also things about what we talked about of procedural mechanisms, right? So this blurs the line a little bit in terms of policies and mechanisms. Um, but at some point, so let's see, what's a good example? So if, if you have a company, do companies need to issue checks to people? To 
to do what? In what circumstances? Like a check, like a money. Yeah. So we don't have that set up yet. So okay, so what's a scenario where a company needs to give a check to somebody? Pay somebody. Contractor. Contractor. So you hire somebody to do something for you. You need to pay them. What else? Buying, so something somebody buys something for the company, they get reimbursed for it. Employees. Employ payroll, big thing, right? People expect to get paid every whatever, twice a week or monthly, right? So all these things need to happen. The question is, how does it happen? When does it happen? As me as an employee, can I just say, yeah, I spent 10 grand for the company, I should be reimbursed for that? Can the CEO just say, yes, I need 50 grand transferred to this account right away because it's we owe this contractor money? So the question is, what procedural mechanisms do you have in place to try to prevent maybe fraud in this case? So, Or <coughs> I guess who's signing the checkbook, right? If it's one person, can they just start issuing checks to themselves and nobody ever knows about it until the company's out of money? Yeah. Would a least privileged policy also work on that as well so you don't grant everyone admin and those that do don't <coughs> log in with admin but have to elevate themselves a similar type of idea usually works here where you could have one person control what checks to or one person who actually can has the power to issue checks but maybe another person who actually has the authority to say what checks to issue so you kind of split that role up so it's not that person has no discretion on what checks to actually give out. It's another person that has to do it. You can even have a third person who has to verify and say, so the person will only issue a check if two people tell them, yes, do this thing. Um, so that would be kind of a procedural mechanism to put into place of, okay, these things have to happen. Or another way to think about this is, uh, does everybody know how to launch a nuke? That got a lot of attention. It's a big red button. Yeah, is it just a big red button that one person pushes? No. 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 Double authentication. So not so they verify everything, and then if I remember correctly, at least the maybe it's I don't think just movies, but the idea is you have two keys, two separate keys that two are on completely opposite sides, so no one person can turn those keys at once, and those keys need to be turned at exactly the same time in order to start everything off. So this is a procedure, so it's a mechanism. So you, the mechanism is you have two different keys and a place physically that one person cannot do it so that the procedure is two people actually have to do it and turn those at the same time. So that it's not the, so that one person can't just do this on their own. So a similar type of thing. Bet you didn't think we were gonna talk about that today. <laughs> so how do we know if our security mechanisms are effective? Is it important for us? Yes? Why? Yeah, because we're using them to combat threats as part of our policy, right? So, so what would be an ineffective security mechanism? If you take the fire training, then completely forget it as soon as there's a fire. Uh, <laughs> that depends on what threat you're talking about. Um, yeah, okay, I probably shouldn't be, I'm not gonna discuss ASU's fire policy, <laughs> except that it's awesome, it does it, and everyone does the training. <laughs> <laughs> so what will be other examples of ineffective security mechanisms? Let's go up here. The example of like blindfolding people. Yeah, like blindfolding people, if you know that people aren't gonna follow your mechanism, or like making them, I don't know, every, so maybe one problem would be coupling super weird and random policies with important policies. So if you said, when you leave the office, you have to jump on one leg and lock the door, right, when you leave. So the important part is locking the doors from a security perspective, but if people think the other thing's stupid, why would they remember to do the second part? Because to them, it just all seems stupid. Yeah. Um. You know those locks that they have like on gates for like backyards? Mm -hmm. Like if you had one of those and replace it like a... Yeah, that you just lift up and yeah. go in. Yeah, or a lot of apartment complexes have something about like only residents are able to use the pool area. And so you need a key to get in, but it's one of those locks that you can just lift from the other side, right? 
But again, if you think about what the threat that they're trying to prevent, it may not necessarily be unauthorized people in the pool. It may be getting sued because an unauthorized person is hurt in the pool area. Because everyone who has a lease with that complex signs something that um, releases the apartment complex from liability if something happens in the pool. And so and they say, well, hey, we have this gate in place that prevents unauthorized people from coming in here. So by you being unauthorized coming into our pool, you deliberately circumvented our mechanism. And so whatever happened to you is on you. It's not on us. Yeah. What do you think about the gates, like on apartment complexes, where you just drive up to and they just open? Uh, silly. Well, <laughs> security theater, maybe. Yeah, it depends. It depends on what the thing is, right? So. I mean, the ones I've seen, you may need a clicker to get in, so you have some authorization, you know, mechanisms or some kind of control there. But again, if you're, if you really want to get in, you wouldn't depend on that mechanism for your life, right? Because people could just follow you in. I mean, it's the same thing that happens in companies, right? With if anyone have a work in a company with a badge. So what do you have to do when you go into work with your badge? You have to swipe it in to get in. Has anyone ever gone to work without their badge? Yep. Yes. How'd you get in? They get check in security. You made check in at security? What about not doing that? Don't get in? Come on yeah, now. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you follow somebody else who gets in. You maybe even fake like you're tapping your badge in and you just walk right in. Or actually I had this horrible circumstance happen to me. I think it was my first internship at Microsoft where it was the end of my internship so I'd given my badge to my boss but I had left the building to maybe go see somebody else, like a friend, and I had to come back to get in my stuff and didn't have my badge. And so I had to beg somebody to let me in, and they're like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And I was like, oh, this is not what you're supposed to do. Right? So that, that then goes to trust to the employees, right? Do you trust the employees to actually not let people, what is it like, it's called? Piggybacking. Piggyback. Piggybacking, yeah. I was thinking tailgating, but that doesn't make sense. That's the other um, term for it, too. Okay. So yeah, so following somebody else in. Um, a good example of this was a company I worked at during my undergrad that um, I think I, it's something weird, like I didn't work there for a year, but I was still on payroll, so I had to go do training, some kind of training thing again. Uh, so I go there to go do it, and as soon as I get in, and this, this was a facility that had a secure facility, but this was like the, un I mean, in terms of like they could look at like classified information or whatever, this was the non-classified part, but I go in and start going to my desk and somebody immediately challenges me and is like, what are you doing here? I don't recognize you. I'm like, oh, I'm Adam. I was an I, you know, I'm an intern here or whatever. And they're like, yeah, I don't believe you. Who's your boss? And I was like, I actually don't remember. Okay, I do remember my boss's name, but I'm not going to say it now. <laughs> um, just for my, so we go to my boss and then he checks with the boss to make sure I'm actually an employee there. Uh, even though I had my badge, I had my badge, but they didn't recognize me, so. Um, yeah, it was a super weird scenario to be in, but it's a good culture to have if your culture is security, right? Because you want to make sure that people just don't waltz in and that it's actually a secure environment. But that's, you know, part of that is creating that culture of where that's okay to do. What other things? So what other things can make a security mechanism insecure? So we talked a lot about people. Yeah. When they're like so overly complicated that people like shortcut them. Yeah. So overly complicated mechanisms that maybe, or yeah. So let's say the fingerprint reader. If you have a fingerprint reader, but it's so uh, unreliable that you just turn it off or disable it. Yeah. If the mechanism, if it's like a lock and it's just like made of plastic. Yeah, if it's a lock that I can just smash with a hammer very easily to destroy it and get in, that would be not very effective. What else? Yeah, what about more technical um, kinds of mechanisms? Any thoughts? Uh, I was going to say, like, not replacing the mechanism. Yeah, so, or not having a policy in place to check the mechanism to make sure it's working, right? So, yeah, not replacing a mechanism. Yeah? Uh, if I have a, something that will on my network scan for open ports that aren't authorized, that might interfere with something that looks for that kind of activity. Mm, interesting. So yeah, having mechanisms that actually violate your own policies and that you have detection mechanisms in place that will trip, yeah, that's a huge problem. What about, if, do people here run antivirus on their computers? Yes. <coughs> yeah? 
it's a good, definitely a good policy to have, a personal policy to have. At the same time, there's been people who found uh, vulnerabilities in antivirus scanners. So that by running that, you actually become more vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. Or you think about a firewall or an intrusion detection system. Um, do they have security vulnerabilities themselves that an attacker can use to basically render them moot? So you think about the physical thing, talking about made of plastic, or talking about being able to jam a big pen in the lock to pop it open. These are very clear physical examples, but those same things can happen in the software realm with a software mechanism that you need to be at least equally aware of to understand the effectiveness of your security mechanisms. Uh, precise, what does being a precise mechanism mean? Yeah, so more in terms of like accuracy like we talked about. So if you have a, if you have, let's say a, like we talked about, a <coughs> facial recognition system, and that facial recognition system lets you in, but also everybody else, it's not a very precise mechanism, right? It doesn't actually work. Or when you start thinking about detection mechanisms, if you have a detection mechanism that's sending a thousand alerts a day, that detection mechanism will get turned off. Unless you're the military. Why? IG office coming down, knocking on your door. What's that? IG office coming down, knocking yeah, on your door. Yeah, or you can force people to look at every single alert and verify it whether it's true or not. Right? Which, uh, it's a lot more difficult to force people to do that in a company. Um, but the military can force people to do things like this. Uh, look through all these snort logs and verify if they're true positives or false positives. Uh, the mechanism may be too broad. Uh, what we just talked about, very similar to precise, it may be too broad, it may allow more people in than it should. Um, so all of these are really kind of around the concept of assurance. And insurance is kind of what I think of is how do you trust that the system is secure? What's your level of trust in this system being secure? And more importantly, why? So what do you think? How can we, how do we trust that a system is secure? Can we ever trust that a system is 100% secure? No. No. I would definitely agree with that statement, no. So how do we, so then do we just go the other route and be like, well, give up, everything can be vulnerable, therefore I do nothing. It mitigates the risks enough to allow us to use it? Yeah, so you can look, so you can look at the threats that you have come up with to the system, you'd look at the policies and mechanisms, you'd see do these policies address these threats, you'd look at the assumptions, right? Is it still usable, so you'd want to think about the users? Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it, but ideally, you like something bad to happen once so that way you know what kind of, you know, like threats you're dealing with, you know, like what, something bad. what your security is. Yeah, so something bad will happen for sure. That's a, uh, so that's an interesting thing. So you can think about assurance in the sense of, and again, it's tricky because if you just think about it as an are we attacked or not, well then you just deliberately don't do any detection and you'll just be like, yeah, it's been six months since we've been attacked. And unbeknownst to you, attackers are in your system stealing your credit cards, right? Um, but if you say, you know, the one way to think about assurance is maybe how many uh, how many scenarios or incidents did we have? How did we ad address them? What was the time frame between detection and recovery? And then what was the time frame between recovery and putting in new policies and mechanisms, right? Because if you're shortening those time frames then you know you're responding a lot quicker and closing kind of those loopholes in your current system. You can pay somebody to give you some level of insurance, right? You can pay somebody to come audit your system. You can pay people to pen test your system. What's the benefit of paying someone to pen test your system? They can break in for someone yeah, so they can identify areas or threats that you have missed or that your policies and mechanisms aren't addressing before a bad guy does. What's the downside? Confidence. 
Yeah, so you may, so let's say you have a pen test, they'll find usually at least one thing. But you fix that one thing, you kick back and go, we're secure. <laughs> no, yeah, you can't do that because a pen test by definition fi will find, let's say, bypasses of your security policy and security mechanisms that violate the security constraints of your organization, but they're not gonna find everything, right? And you ran a pen test three months ago, or six months ago, and let's say they didn't find anything, which is maybe good. Does that mean you're still secure in some sense now? Why not? Not just new vulnerabilities, but your system changes, right? Your developers are writing, pushing new code. You have new employees in, right? All of these things mean that your system and the scenario is constantly changing. So you need to be thinking about these things in terms of that. Um, can you quantify assurance? Yeah. Think about that, put a number on it. Insurance? Assurance, not insurance. Yeah, but you can insure, like, insurance each For some things, yeah. yes, but for, let's say, uh, computer security and cyber security, can you quantify it? No, sure. Let's think about that. And then assurance, you also, we also want to think on who can this depend on. So I want you to think about this quantification question, if you can quantify assurance. If you have good ideas, then you should start a company. <coughs>